Our scripture today comes from the book of Philippians, uh, chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. And in the Pew Bibles, that's on page 1,179, if you'd like to follow along. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Thank you so much, Jolene. And thank you, Betty. We are looking forward to being a part of the Operation Christmas Child again this year. And we're just getting a jump on the season. We've already got the tree up. I was remembering my, very, my second church appointment. It was a new church start, uh, which meant you kind of go and start from scratch, basically. And it was in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I was living several hours away from my family. I was there by myself, and for some reason, I just felt um, a little lonely, a little sad. So I thought, I'm going to do something. I'm going to put the Christmas tree up. So I put the Christmas tree up that year before Halloween. So we feel, just feel right at home with the Christmas tree up already. I remember having a repair person that had to come over somewhere. I'm like, I'm, he's going to think I'm completely insane with the Christmas tree up before Halloween. But in any case, we're glad to be a part of this ministry. We're continuing our message series on what do United Methodists believe anyway. And our particular topic today is means of grace. So let's take a look at that. But first, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to come as a family and friends, partners in faith. And thank you for all of our friends who are listening and watching online across America and around the world. We welcome them. And we know that together, we're going to look a little bit deeper into your scripture, become more aware of who you are for us and who we are for you and who together we can be for the world. Speak to us now, Lord, for we are listening. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. By the way, today, um, after church, um, Jolene's family is getting together to celebrate Isabella Sloat's 18th birthday on Tuesday, but they're going to celebrate a little bit early, so if they can celebrate early, we can too. Happy birthday, Isabella. We're very happy to celebrate. All right. What do United Methodists believe anyway? We've talked about that for the last three weeks now. Today, we're going to focus on the means of grace. What is the word grace? We hear about that a lot. We sing about it. Amazing grace. We hear people talk about grace. What is this concept of grace? If we were to define grace, grace is defined as the unmerited, unearned favor of God. The unmerited, unearned favor of God. Another way to say it would be the unearned forgiveness of God. So we sin, we commit mistakes, we do this, that, or the other thing. We can ask God for forgiveness. That concept is grace from a theological perspective. So if we're going to take a look at that from the United Methodist perspective, we divided that up throughout history into three different areas of grace. And those of you who are in the confirmation class with me uh, several months ago, this will be a refresher course for you. You already know that. For others of you, you'll remember it from years past. Maybe for some, it'll be something new. I hope so. The three ways that we divide grace up in the United Methodist Church is this. Prevenient, justifying, and sanctifying grace. Let me just take a moment to unload, unpack each of those. Number one, prevenient grace we touched on last week. That is the grace that says, even if you've never heard of Jesus, even if you don't know who God is, even if you've never heard of who the Lord is for you, Jesus lived and died and rose again before you knew who he was. Before, beforehand, prior knowledge, prevenient, before you knew Jesus did. That's prevenient grace. And we believe people can receive the Lord no matter what their background, no matter what they've gone through, because of the sacrifice that happened beforehand. The next uh, level of grace is justifying grace. Just as if I had never sinned. Justified. When you receive the Lord Jesus into your heart and you say, Lord, please come in and live within me. Forgive me for my sins. You are then justified you are made right. You are forgiven of your sins. You are justified. And to, the, to all the angels of heaven, you are as if you had never sinned at all. As if you had never made a mistake. 
justifying grace. Then the third one is sanctifying grace. Perhaps it's the most important one when it comes to living a long life as a Christian, when it comes to eternity as a Christian. The others, we hope, are, are something that we're aware of, that we were accepted prior to knowing who God was, that we were justified by grace through faith, the Bible says. And, of course, we continue to sin even though we don't want to. There are still issues, and we believe we are forgiven as we ask for, for the Lord's grace and forgiveness. But in terms of the long haul, the long-term relationship of faith, sanctifying grace is the one for us. And that is to become more holy. Each day to become holier than we were the day before. Each day to become more spiritual, closer to the Lord than we were the day before. This holiness movement which swept the country at the beginning of the last century came from these Methodist revival meetings, Methodist brush arbor meetings in this part of the country, Methodist tent meetings in, in the western part of, the, uh, of our nation. Uh, idea that you can be holy, that you can, have, you can have authority over your own life and your choices make a difference and we can choose to be holy or we can choose to be you know, the opposite of holy. We can choose to be worldly, etc. But we can choose then not just to pray and say, God, help me, but to actually do something to become holier on our own, to be able to take um, the reins of our life and say, we will choose to become holier. That holiness movement swept the country over 100 years ago. So that is the concept of, of grace from a theological perspective when it comes to the United Methodist Church. But when it comes to the means of grace, it's a whole nother, whole nother avenue. Grace, when it comes to salvation and forgiveness and holiness, is one avenue of this concept of grace. But then, John Wesley took it to another level when he talks about means of grace. And if you are listening during the children's moment in between celebrating Ohio State winning, you heard me say that means of grace are channels of God's grace, ways of delivery of God, the presence of God to others. Now, as Christians, we would like to be the presence of God. So, means of grace uh, basically is this. How can we be formed in the image of Jesus? How can we be conformed and formed to the image of Christ? And how can we draw closer in our relationship with God? What are some things we can do to grow our relationship with the Lord to the extent that we take on His Form, that, we, that we are more like Jesus because of our relationship. You've heard me say many times how the early church ancestors, our early church ancestors in Bible times, the first century, would greet one another often. They would say that Jesus in me recognizes or sees the Jesus in you. If we are conformed in the image of Christ, we then take on the image of Jesus for one another. We are sharing his goodness, his love with one another and with the world. So the means of grace is this idea of putting feet to our faith and reality to our religion. And John Wesley put it this way. John Wesley, of course, the founder of the Methodist movement, which was a revival movement, focusing on my very first sermon in this series, Solo Cristo, Solo Scriptura, only Jesus, only the Bible, the foundation, the core beliefs of the Methodist church. So John Wesley broke it down this way in terms of the means of grace. The delivery system of God to you and to the world came in these two packages. Number one, acts of piety and acts of mercy. The first one is this, acts of piety. What does that mean? It's kind of a church word, isn't it? It is. But it means building your own faith an act of piety would be a way to build yourself up, to grow your own personal faith, to understand who God is for you because you are taking time to develop your relationship with God. Here are some examples. Reading the Bible on a regular and consistent basis. Coming to church and worshiping with like believers. Going to a Bible study. Going to a small group. Um, reading devotional books. It's taking time for prayer and reflection of, uh, of the Lord in your life. All of these things that takes an initial commitment from us to do it. We can't just come to church and expect someone else to do it for us. This is another level of where we're saying we're going to take responsibility, responsibility for ourselves and not wait for somebody else to open our skull and pour it in. We're going to do something for ourselves. We're going to read the Bible ourselves. We're going to pray during the week. We're going to do something beyond that. This idea of cell group that we, we hear about frequently in uh, 
20th and 21st century America did not originate with us. It didn't originate in the 1980s or the 90s or even the 2000s. This idea of cell group and uh, came all the, way, all the way back to the early 1700s and to our friend John Wesley and his compatriots, Charles Wesley and George Whitfield and Robert Strawbridge and others. And they had this idea of celebration being church on Sunday morning. You would come to celebrate. And then they used to play on words and said, but during the week we're going to separate the cell and have cell groups so on Sunday we can have celebration. You can see the way they were using the play on words. So during the week, Methodists would get together in these cell groups or small groups. And they would pray and they would read the Bible and they would hear a message and they would give an, uh, an offering, and then they would commit to go do something, like visiting someone in the prisons, visiting somebody in the hospital, visiting somebody in their home. And they would receive a ticket dur- if they did those things. They would come on uh, went Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whenever their particular cell group met, and they would get their ticket, and someone would say to them, okay, who did you visit this week, and what was their response? They would punch their ticket. And then... Um, have you done other things during the week? Have you prayed? Have you read the Bible, etc.? Yes, I have. This is what I read. This is what I learned. Okay, tick, punch your ticket. And thirdly, did you bring an offering to give? It could have been a farthing or a or a, 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 a whatever their whatever their monetary was back then. Monetary exchange in England was could be the smallest amount, but at least it was something. Did you bring an offering? Yes. Okay, they got their ticket punched. That was at their cell group, and then. On Sunday morning, when they would come to the larger celebration of all the cell groups coming together, somebody would be at the door, not one of our friendly greeters and welcomers who say, welcome to church, here's your bulletin, but somebody would say to you something like, welcome to church, where's your ticket? I left it at home. Well, go get it and come back. What? I live, I live two, two, three miles down the road. Go get it and come back. Or, oh yes, I brought my ticket. You just have two of your things punched. What happened to the third one? Well, I, I just didn't have time to go visit so-and-so this week. I meant to, but I could go visit them and then come back. I'm not, I'm not joking with you. This was, a, this was how strict it was back in the day. You had to have your ticket, and you had to have your ticket punched to show that you were doing these, um, these means of grace, that you were being a channel for Jesus to the world, that you were making a difference in the world. Now, we're not going to make you have a ticket or or punch your ticket to, to come into church, but it is a good reminder when we think about these means of grace and the history of our church. What is our purpose as believers? Why do we exist? What is it that we are doing with this idea of faith? So a work of piety is how are we building our own life up, our life of faith, our prayer time, our Bible reading. Are we really taking seriously what we're doing? If people have questions of faith, and I hear it all the time, and I think that's perfectly fine to ask questions. Perfectly fine, and we will do our best to answer them. But often, we need to find the time to be reading the Bible and to be praying and to, re- to, to be thinking these issues through through our own prayer time and our own Bible study because then we are growing our relationship with the Lord and we are, we are growing in our faith and, and in our likeness of Jesus. Isn't that a remarkable thing? We're growing more and more and more like Jesus, which makes us stand out from every other religion. Because we have an example who actually shows who God is for us. Jesus is the best example we have of who God is for us. And the more we are spending time with him, the more we become like him and are formed and shaped in his image. The reason I say that's different than any other religion, because you won't find um, someone um, saying to you, you need to study and to become more like Hare Krishna. Or you need to study and become more like Buddha. Or you need to study and become more like Muhammad. Because those people were so um, separated from their followers, so um, distanced, you might say, from their followers. There was not this one-on-one relationship. It was, you do this or else. You do this or you're going to die. You do this and you're going to be cast away if you don't you know, do what we're telling you to do. What word Jesus is saying, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My burden is light and my yoke is easy. We're doing it to become more like the Lord who shows us who God is. Um, It's not something we are compelled to do because we're afraid, but it's something we are able to do because we want to be more like the Lord. That's works of piety. Now works of mercy. What would be a work of mercy? A work of mercy would be 
ways that we have to show other people who God is. So works of piety, we're building our own faith up. We're, we're equipping ourselves, and we're being equipped by coming to church. And then we take that and we do something with it, like the Operation Christmas Child, for example, like helping the needy, for example, like giving to the church, for example, like um, volunteering and, and, and giving acts of service. These acts of mercy are ways that we are tangibly living out our faith in our community and in our world. We are taking this call of faith seriously, and we are saying we are going to do something to show the world that what we believe is not just a Sunday morning thing. It's not just like a club that we go to, like the Lions Club or the Rotary Club or the Optimist Club or one of the other very valuable civic community groups that certainly have an important part to play. But it's much more than that because we are coming to be equipped so that we then might be the light and the salt to the world. A light illuminates salt preserves. This is what we're called to do. Jesus, you heard in the scripture that Jolene read, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. It was something that was innate to him. It was something that was who he was. He lived and died and rose again so that he might open that door for all of us to, to become a part of who the Lord wants us to be, to become formed in God's image. Now, if you were to go to any Methodist church anywhere in the world, and you were to ask the preacher, what are means of grace, preacher? Hopefully, they will be able to articulate what I just shared with you about the works of piety and the works of mercy and, and this whole concept of how we are becoming formed in the image of Jesus. But typically what you're going to hear, uh, and it would still be a correct answer, the preacher would probably say to you, well, works of mercy and works of piety in this idea of means of, of grace can be boiled down to Holy communion and baptism. That would be a correct answer. Some of the channels in which we are, we are shaped and formed in the image of God comes from this concept of holy communion and baptism. But for many, many years, friends, baptism was not included in means of grace. Because the idea of means of grace is something that you repeatedly do on a regular and constant basis. For example, when it comes to the sacraments of the United Methodist Church, we do holy communion at least, at least once a month. The church I was at before coming here, it was offered every Sunday in, the, in a chapel setting. So people after church wanted to go into the smaller chapel and have communion, they could. John Wesley, when he was alive, celebrated Holy Communion every day because he felt it was important. But at least in the United Methodist Church, we know that we're going to do it at least the first Sunday or the first weekend of the month. This is something we constantly and regularly do. If we're praying, we want to do that every day. If we're reading the Bible, we want to do that as much as we can, repetitively. However, baptism, we believe, is a one-time thing. And so it's not something that's repetitive. It's something we remember on a regular basis, but we only do it once. And therefore, it wasn't initially added into these means of grace, if that makes sense. But throughout history, it was then adopted in because it is a channel of God's grace to us when we are baptized and become a part of the family of faith. So probably the preacher would say Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper and baptism. Means of grace, means of being adopted into the family of God and then formed in His image that we might then go into the world and be who God has called us to be for Him. A couple hundred years ago, in fact, even in the early church, if you were to, to travel with the Apostle Paul and you were to say to him, Hey, Paul... We would like to have Holy Communion. He would look at you like, what, what does that mean? But we would, like to have, um, we would like to have the Lord's Supper. Okay, tell me more about what that is. That's not how they referred to it back then in the first century. They referred to it with an interesting term called the love feast. Did you ever know that? Back in the, back in the early church, our ancestors referred to communion as the love feast. Now, I know 1960s. Southern California and et cetera, a new, new term for the love feast, but um, uh, so that was later changed. But early church, they felt like the love of Jesus was displayed through his life and death on the cross and his resurrection power. Therefore, this love was shared with others through the bread and the drink. So in a couple of weeks when we have communion, remember that we are remembering the love of God through Jesus with the bread and the juice. These are all transformational things that can be considered the means of grace. What about you and for me? What does it mean when it comes to the rubber meeting the road for you and me? How are we living out our faith for each other? Are we being good to one another? Are we being good to, each, to, to the community? Are we expressing Jesus in a way that is tangible and real 
and enticing for people to say, I want to become a part of that. I want to learn more about this, this faith you're talking to me about. But more importantly, perhaps even than that, how are we representing this Lord Jesus to ourselves so that we can then be equipped to share him with the world? Are we really taking seriously this idea of building ourselves up? I can do the best I can for you, friends, and I, and I literally do my best for you every Sunday morning and throughout the week when we're together. But there's only so much I can do or any other preacher can do. It has to be ourselves taking up the responsibility to say, I'm going to also build up my own faith. I'm going to read the Bible on my own. I'm going to pray on my own. I'm going to come to the church events on my own. I'm going to come and I'm going to actually take the responsibility of doing these things. And in fact, I'm going to invite friends to come with me so that I am taking initiative to being a part of this family of faith. These are things that are so core and central to what it is to be a Methodist. We are building up our faith, and we are then being Jesus to the world. And when we do that, friends, things change. Lives change. People change. We change. Not just to change for change's sake, but we become formed and shaped in the image of Jesus. And we are then for the world what he has always been for us, a second chance, new hope, new life, a future for eternity. I pray that for you and for me and for all of our friends who are tuning in, we choose this week to be formed and shaped in the image of Jesus, that we might truly make a difference, an impact for this community and to wherever we are sent. Let's pray. Lord, you're reminding us, Lord, about what it is to be a means of grace what it is to be a channel of your mercy and your goodness and your grace to people, what it is to take responsibility for our faith and to, to build ourselves up in our most holy faith, as the Bible says, to, to grow in our hearts and our minds and our souls to such an extent that we are actually taking on the image, the shape of you. And we are then being to the world what you have been to us. This, this concept of means of grace, Lord, is so important and so significant to the foundation of our faith. May we portray and, and actually live out this week the gifts of piety, the gifts of mercy. May we become holier. May we, like that old song says, love you more dearly, follow you more nearly, to be much more like you. Thank you for that, Lord. We receive it and we're grateful for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.